Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day we get to think through how to defend the faith. I thank you for Van Til and Bonson and for the work that they, they labored so faithfully over this last century. I pray that you would raise up apologists to continue their work and that we would be, as a church and as a CREC, uh, a leader in apologetics. Amen. All right, we only have two more sessions left. This is going quicker than I had anticipated. So we have this one, which will finish the argument today, and then we'll go on to some cleanup work uh, next time. Do a little of that this time as well. And then next time, you can ask some qu last uh, questions next time, and then we'll be done. All right, so in uh, part six last week, here's a summary of what we did. We showed how Wittgenstein's language game uh, his games relate to our use of axioms. So the general gist of this is that if you, to, to reject this use of language, right, to, to go contrary, is, to, is to, ground, uh, to ground the game, to make it run idle, to, to ground the machine. It doesn't work anymore. And so we talked about that. We used the example of if you, de if you deny that this, the Bible teaches this doctrine plainly, then all of language breaks down. The whole game breaks down if we do that. So it's not an acceptable objection. And we do, and we do that over and over when we talk about uh, the axioms. Uh, we went through axioms two through four and various objections relating to, to them. We then proved or deduced theorem one, which is that the Bible plainly teaches that all people know that God created the world. They know that with certainty. The fourth thing we did was we, we responded to the direct acquaintance objection, which is a very popular objection from philosophers. And lastly, we went through axiom five and then deduced theorem two, which is if, uh, if one can show that a anti-Christian worldview teaches or uh, is sufficient foundation for knowledge, then you've demonstrated, or one can demonstrate that the Bible teaches an error. And then we're gonna pick up with that uh, today. Okay, so last time we proved theorem two, if one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge, then one can demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. The second uh, thing that we're gonna put with this argument is our fourth axiom probably one of my favorite ones to, to bring up to, to atheists. So this is that no one can demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. So we're gonna assume that from, from the beginning. No one can demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. Now by demonstration, I don't mean, in a way I mean deduction. So I don't mean just, uh, hey, evolution is true, therefore this is messed up, right? This is wrong. Or uh, the Bible teaches that certain Acts of genocide were okay by the Israelites. We know that's wrong, therefore the Bible is, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you actually, act, actually have to lay out this, this, this objection, okay? Actually put it into some kind of form where we show that the Bible is teaching, or that, uh, <clears throat> that you can demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. And I like this because all, all, all apologists assume this to be true, and, and yet we, we rarely actually just state it to, to the unbeliever. But, but at any point in any apologetical interaction, I don't care if you're an evidentialist or a presuppositionalist, if an atheist has an objection that truly undermines the Bible, it's over, right? So we're just inviting that. We're just saying, look, I don't think you have one. I don't think there is one. In fact, I know this is true. I'm gonna assume it's true from the start. If you don't like it, then disprove it. Go ahead. We talked about that last time. Okay, so think, so look at this then. Look how we, see if you can put this together. What this is, is just a simple if P, then Q, that's the first one. Second, axiom four is not Q. And then the, what, what should we infer then? If P, then Q, not Q, therefore, what? Not P, not P. very good, you know what that's called? What's that? I heard it. Modus tollens. Those classically educated Christians in the audience. Yes, modus tollens is a very uh, basic and yet useful uh, way to reason. 
So with this, we can infer then that no one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. No one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. So notice what's been, what's been done here then. We've refuted all other possible uh, worldviews as be, if you accept the axioms as being a sufficient foundation for knowledge. Now someone could say, well, what about this example, right? And I can show how that's like uh, Islam or Jehovah's Witnesses or atheists or polytheists or whatever. We can get into the examples, the, the individual examples of worldviews. But notice, if I were to refute five of them for you, that doesn't refute the other possible ones. Does that make sense? Like it, you can't refute all of them by individually going through each one because they're never ending. There'll be new ones 10 years from now. So what we did is we refuted the whole thing. Okay, the whole thing is gone if you accept these four axioms or these five, five axioms. <clears throat> so if you, if you disagree with this theorem, you either have to show that you have an example of one, <clears throat> which would then show us that one of our axioms is false, or you'd have to show us that one of the axioms is false. But I like this because it clarifies things. Like, there's, there's no dispute of where we should be moving here, where we, should, where we should be arguing. If you don't like it, great. Do your worst. Like, either refute this theorem right now, or refute one of the axioms. If you can't do that, then I'm sorry, just by plain old logic, this is what we get. If we're gonna be rational, this is what we should conclude. Okay, now so, uh, this is probably one of my favorite, obje favorite objections that I hear from skeptics and mostly students will bring this up. Atheists typically don't bring this up, but they could. And that is they, they bite the bullet and they say, you know what, I'm a modern day prophet. I have revelation from God. So I can ground all these things because I am a modern day prophet. And what I find, I, I love this objection because <laughs> You're an atheist who despises, apparently, faith, even though he has an abundance of it, <clears throat> blind faith, but he despises these things. He despises religion, supposedly, and yet would turn then <laughs> to claim that he's an oracle of God. I mean, you just got to find that humorous, that, that you, clearly nothing else is working for him if he's turning to this kind of objection. Which is great, and we, we welcome these kinds of objections. Okay, so if this were to happen, which I've never seen someone actually play this out. This is almost exclusively given by Christian students in classrooms trying to uh, refute their, their professor, which is great. I, I welcome that from students. So how, how would I respond to this? Uh, so there, there are two possible, possible scenarios here. Either the objector says, I'm a modern day prophet, but won't tell me anything about his religion, right? He just claims to have this alternative, but he won't, he won't bless anyone else with it, right? He just keeps it all internal. Well, that's irrelevant to this then. That's like saying, no, I have an objection to your axiom. Oh, well, what is it? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. Okay, well, that's, that's not how this game works. Okay, this, you're not reasoning at that, at that point. So that's not relevant to this, if someone's not going to actually give me what this worldview is, if he's a modern-day prophet. Who is your God, sir? And what did he, how, the history of the world, like, what's this God like? He created the world, apparently, and, and so forth, right? There, there's a lot that goes into actually having a worldview that can account for a reality. So the second, then, is let's say he wants to, to play this out. I say, great, I will buy you food. I will provide paper and pencils for you. I will provide probably rent for a month just to like see this out. And you write down your revelation. I want to see it. You can't use the Bible because obviously your God shouldn't need my God. Okay, so, so you sit down and you write it out. You write out perfect revelation that is sufficient for us to know that reality is reliable. Go ahead. I will finance this just to prove my point. And he won't do that. Do you realize how hard it is to actually think about a perfect history of the world and, and like a, a, a perfect conception 
of, of God, where we wouldn't see inconsistencies with the world and God and, and even conceptually, that's very difficult. We just take that for granted because we're Christians and we have the solution. If you look at the history of the world, the gods that are made and the religions that are made, it's a joke, this, this, this stuff that's, that's created. When man creates things in suppressing the truth of God, it's laughable what he creates in. What, what would happen in this is the person would probably just be taking the Bible and trying to chase, change a couple of things. It's very difficult just to write your own revelation. In fact, the ones that are the closest to doing it explicitly copied the Bible, like Islam. Okay, like the closer you get to some kind of defensible history of the world, well, you just had to take it from the Bible. So modern day prophet, I welcome the subjection. Okay, now on to our next one. This is a key part of the, of the argument. <clears throat> We're gonna, let's chew on this for a little bit. If Christianity is a sufficient foundation for knowledge, so there are two components to this. If, it's a, if, it, if it is a sufficient foundation for knowledge, and no one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge, then Christianity is the only sufficient foundation for knowledge. All right, if Christianity is sufficient, you can't demonstrate that there is any other one, then what should we infer from that? Or what's implied from that? It's the only one. It is the only one. Now someone could say, well, that could be false. This axiom could be false. Well, how could it be false? In, in, in a conditional statement, if P then Q, the only way uh, will, we, will we all agree on, and no matter what kind of conditional statement we're, we're, we're using here, that if the, if the left side is true, call that the antecedent, I guess in your it'd be this side for you guys. So if the left side is true, the right side, if it's false, then that conditional is always false. Always, it doesn't matter what kind of conditional you're working with. So if the left side is true, if the right side is false, right, then the conditional is false. So when we look at this, this axiom, what you'd have to show is that the left side can be true, and yet the right side is false. So let me, let me break that out for a little bit then. All right, so let's assume that Christianity is the only sufficient foundation for knowledge, and that you can't demonstrate there's any other anti-Christian worldview that is. Let's assume those, both those two things are true. Is there a possible world in which uh, Christianity is not the only su sufficient foundation for knowledge? And the answer is no. You have no, you have no, if you can't demonstrate ever that another one is, then you can't hypothesize in any intelligible way a world in which there is an exception. You guys tracking with me on that? You, you have no evidence, you never will, that another worldview is sufficient for knowledge. So how, could you, how can you ever construct then a possible world in which there is one? You have, no way, you, have no, you have no evidence for it. You have no way to even conceptualize it. You have no way to, to write it down. It's completely blind. So I think it's reasonable then to infer that it's the only sufficient foundation for knowledge. So again, if you would object to this, you'd have to show me how this is possible, which again, you have no evidence for, and so you're not reasoning at that point. Bonson talks about this. He says, unbelievers who have for the most part abandoned rationality or have become indifferent to giving reasons for what they believe, have thereby stepped outside of the circle of apologetical concern. And that's really important in all of this. Whenever we, by having the argument in deductive form like this and moving method, um, systematically throughout this, you'll see people throw out objections because they don't like where we're going, but they can't, but they can't tell me why. It's just, I just don't like where we're going or I don't like this. And we have to make sure that we identify that that's not relevant. It's not relevant to apologetics. Okay, well, have we proven the left side? Yes. So theorem one, Christianity is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. And theorem three, no one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. So what follows, this is again just modus ponens with 
T1 and T3 with uh, axiom six, we infer Christianity is the only sufficient foundation for knowledge. This is, yes? How do you answer if they say, well, just because no one can demonstrate it doesn't mean it doesn't exist? Exactly. So in, in that response, they say, um, what good evidence do you have that there is an alternative? Well, they just like to say, well, not, but that doesn't mean that P then Q. No, no. It, it, so so but when, we, when we say things are possible, we have to give some kind of like, meaning to what that is. Possibility has to have, we have to, like, you say, if I gave you gibberish and said, this is possibly true, it's like, well, I don't even know what. Then what are we doing it, it, if, if who bites the bullet? If they bite the bullet and say, well, I can't provide evidence, but I'm just saying that the P then Q, just because no one can demonstrate it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No, so, so the, you'd, have to, you'd have to disagree with axiom six, that that, that conditional is false. That's what you'd have to dispute. But you have no reason for that it is. But isn't that an argument for me, No, it, it, for you it is, yes. For you it is, but not for me. You've accepted that you can't demonstrate ever that an anti-Christian worldview is sufficient for knowledge. You've, you've get, that's, what, that's what theorem three is. If you conceded that you can't demonstrate ever that there's a sufficient foundation other than Christianity. And you've, and you've conceded that Christianity is sufficient. So my point is, your argument is an argument from ignorance then. It will forever be an argument for, for ignorance. It's not like you're admitting that only, only right now, but in 10 years from now, I might find one. No, you're admitting in this argument that you never will. No one ever will, not just you. The history of humanity never will. Now you say, well, I don't like that. Well, fine but then you have to refute one of these axioms. So then maybe T3 is the argument. So T3 is just what we prove from the axiom of um, uh, just previously. Let me. Um, I'm going back now. Yeah, we did it at the end of the last. Let me just pull it up. OK, so we did this with, t oh, we, no, we did today with, with T2. So yeah, this one. So we proved this from the assumption that the Bible plainly teaches that all anti-Christian worldviews are insufficient for knowledge. Right, we, talk, we talked about that last time. So if you can demonstrate that there is one, right, then you could demonstrate the Bible teaches a falsehood. But you already, so the, key, the key really in all of this is you can't demonstrate the Bible teaches a falsehood. That's the key in all of this. If you could do that, then the whole thing would unravel, as would apologetics anyways, right? So that's not really a risk for us. But because you can't do that, you have to accept all the rest of this. And this is my point with, with uh, uh, unbelief here, what, where you put them, is they're just sitting there with nothing to offer. All they are offering is, I just don't like this. There could be something in the future that refutes you. I have no evidence for that or no reason to believe that's true. Well, that's not arguing. That's not rational. That's just you irrationally holding on to your unbelief. Yeah, Arnie. It goes back to an atheist saying, there is no God and I hate him because I'm not. Yes. That's, a hard, that's the heart of atheism. And what I, love, what I like about this is it makes it, 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 they can't squirm out of it. Notice I haven't talked about atheism here. I haven't brought up the inconsistencies in their own life, in their own lives. I haven't brought up why materialism is false. We'll get to that at the end of this. But they don't, I don't, it's, I'm taking ownership of the argument and saying, look, I don't even care what you believe. Let me show you why this is true. Come and, come and, and interact with the proof. And because it's a proof, they can't wiggle out of it. It's not. That's, that's. Um, opposite of what an evidentialist will do, he's always on the defensive. Yes, and correct. Yes, correct. And, and you're on the offensive. Yes. And, and what's nice about having it, what's so beautiful about deduction is it clarifies exactly what I'm saying and how I'm getting there. And the only way to disagree with it is either to refute an axiom, 
to refute how we're reasoning, which this is just logical, so you can't really do that, or to refute the meaning of our terms. I think those are the three, the three options. If you can't do that, then you, you don't have to accept the argument. I can't force you to do things. But that doesn't mean it's rational what you're doing. In fact, it's irrational at that point. Good, guys. Very good. Should we go on? Or do you have? No, yeah. The mode is stolen is what I forgot. It's a very clever way to do that. OK. Basically, just everything relies on their ability to be able to disprove the Bible when they can't. Yes, correct. So that almost really doesn't matter. Yes. Axiom 4 is very important. I mean, they all are important, but. What all this really relies on is that they believe in logic. Yeah, oh, they have to, yes. But if they don't believe in logic, it's a. And they're not part. They're, not man, so they're the unman. The yep. Then they're not part of the game we're playing. Yeah, Kanan. So what if they start picking up, so falsehood, like the definition of the term falsehood? Mm -hmm. So what if they start coming at that from different angles of, oh, like, well, there's evidence that this proves in this direction. So they're not going from a theological or ethical direction. Mm -hmm. From a, the petty stuff that it is and holds that sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, falsehood, I think we could have a pretty common definition on and just, um, <clears throat> if it's a formal falsehood, that just means it's a contradiction. You're affirming a proposition and its opposite. So P and not P would be a formal you know, falsehood. Um, another falsehood would be empirical, like you have empirical truth that you deny, right, but you also accept. Like it's a, so that would be you contradicting yourself. Or, or, you, or we have proven that this is true empirically. You hold the opposite, so you're teaching a falsehood, right? That would be a way to do it. So the way they could do this is they can, they can. We talked about this with the buckets earlier, right? We have the defensive and the offensive. In the in the defensive, they're just bringing up either inconsistencies within the Christian worldview. Uh, assume it's true, it leads to a contradiction just internally or assume it's true and it contradicts what we know is true in the world, right? So either one of those would, would be problematic in what you're talking about. Like, that's what they'd have to do. And, and again, we, that's what Axiom 4 brings out. It says, look, bring it out. I'd love to see it. So ultimately, the offensive is built upon defense. But we just assume that it's <clears throat> true and say, come at me. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, um, it's, yeah, Axiom 4 is very much inviting the defensive. Yeah, that's good, Justin. Yep. That's why I love Axiom 4, because it's, it, we, I don't think I've seen this ever in an argument. I don't think I've ever seen someone just state it bluntly up front, and then just, but we all clearly bring this to our engagement. Yeah, well, so it gets back to my problem with Axiom 4, which is that's where all the debates already are. So they could go, the Bible teaches that Christ rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. People don't rise from the dead, therefore Bible teaches falsehood. But they have to, hold on though, but I'm talking about, they have to demonstrate the Bible teaches the falsehood. You just assumed that people can't rise from the dead. How do you know that's true? Demonstrate that to me. Well, no one that you've seen. That's clearly not a good argument though. So what evidence do you have that there are no resurrections? How is that different from the no one can demonstrate that a man is a Christian? So I'm saying you'd have to prove that people are actually dead. No, I, I already know they do. The Bible teaches that, 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 that they do. There's evidence that people do rise from the dead. Now, you disagree with that, and that's fine. Um, but if you're going to say, this is really key, if you're going to say that the Bible uh, teaches P, and we know empirically that P is false, then you need to demonstrate first that P, um, that not P is true. You first have to demonstrate that empirically to me. You can't just say, well, evolution is true, Bible teaches anti-evolution, so the Bible is false. Well, no, no, you first have to show me that you can prove that to be true and bring it on. Right? Show me empirically that these, these things are true, then you can't. Okay, so, but notice though, and we think that this is, this is such an objectionable point. This is apologetics. Every encounter you could possibly get into, if anyone can bring this up and it truly holds up now, it's problematic for the entire thing.
no matter who you are and what your apologetical system is. And we talked about that a, a few sessions ago, about welcoming that and what, it would, what that would look like. Very good, guys. Okay, so this point right here, Theorem 4, is the most talked about, it, they would call it a premise, because most arguments in this don't actually prove the premise that's just kind of out there. But this, this is, when, you, when you hear Van Til and Bonson talking about this, Theorem 4 is what they mostly talk about the apologetic being. They would refer to Theorem 4. And most people, when they talk about transcendental arguments, it's, it's what Theorem 4 is saying. Although it would be Christianity for these philosophers, it'd be some, something else in our world. But that, that is the theorem or the premise in which makes a transcendental argument distinct from all other kinds of arguments. The preconditions of knowledge is a common phrase. So, when, so now you know, see, now, now we can take what Van Til and Bonson say and clearly put it to where the, it is in the argument. So if you have the argument laid out, you can take their quotes and then line them up and see, you can track now actually where they're, where they're going or where they are in it. He says, if the triune God of scripture did not exist and if he did not do what he says in scripture, he does <clears throat> create and direct the whole course of history. The unbeliever would have no standing place in order to engage in his effort by his false systems to deny the existence and work of God. So if this is not true, then he, he does not have knowledge, <clears throat> which is just the inverse of what we, what we proved. It is but to say that Christianity alone is rational. It is but to say that if one leaves the foundation of the presupposition of the truth of the Christian religion, that sounds so complicated. It's not, okay, it's, it's not. Our, uh, one falls into the quagmire of the utterly irrational. No intelligent predication is possible except on the basis of the truth that is the absolute truth of Christianity. That's just a great statement because it's common in broad brush evangelicalism today to use emotion or mm -hmm. something to think that we, through arguments, can change somebody's heart. Yes. And it's just impossible. Yes. We're told to have an apologetic, we're mm -hmm. told to evangelize, we're told to make disciples. But that statement makes it 100% clear throughout all scripture that only God took into person heart. Yeah. Only Cor God can do it. Correct. Yet, until still, he still commands us to go do it. Mm -hmm. Van Til, probably my favorite writing in apologetics that I've ever read from anyone is Van Til's short little uh, article or <clears throat> why I believe in God. <clears throat> this is like 15 to 18 pages. It's beautiful. It is like, <clears throat> it is made for classical Christian schools. <laughs> it is rhetorically persuasive. It is the prose. It's probably his best use of pro. Uh, it's the richest use of his prose. Um, he, but at the end of it, <clears throat> he says, he's, he's, he's interacting with this unbeliever. And he says something to the effect of, uh, you're right, I can't change your heart. Um, only my heavenly father can do that. And it's in his hands I leave you. <laughs> And he just like ends the argument, right? It's in his hands that I leave you. Have a good day. <laughs> you know, like there's nothing more to do. And that's the right. That's the correct response. We can't change hearts. Why I believe in God. It's beautiful. There's a different online. It should be a PDF. If you, if you want it, I have it. I can send it to you. Uh, the presuppositional, this is Bonson. The presuppositional challenge to the unbeliever is guided by the premise that only the Christian worldview provides the philosophical preconditions necessary for man's reasoning and knowledge in any field, whatever. This is a key thrust in Van Til's challenge to unbelievers. Various types of claims made by the unbeliever assume order in human experience, logical, causal, moral, but the unbeliever cannot warrant any claims about reality as a whole. So you guys, this all makes sense to you now because we had just been going through this and improving it. But if you hadn't had any of this <clears throat> and you were just reading through this, you probably would agree with it, but how do you prove that, right? We've just shown how to do that. Cormac McCarthy talks about this, and only, and only, only way McCarthy can, uh, which is beautifully. And, and he talks about uh, the world needing a witness, but God needing no witness. I love this quote. He goes, that God needs no witness, neither to himself nor against. Ah. Oh. The truth is rather that if there were no God, then there could be no witness, for there could be no identity to the world. 
Every breath taken that does not bless is an affront, for nothing is real save his grace. It's just, I could quote McCarthy all day. It's just beautiful. Okay, so now let's end the argument. Christianity is the only sufficient foundation for knowledge. <clears throat> so another way we can put that is, if there's knowledge, then Christianity is true. That's another way you could, you could write that, or word that. All right, but we have to assume that there is a person who has knowledge. That's our last axiom. There is a person, S, who has knowledge. Now, there is a person who has knowledge. And so we, we and, and Van Til admits this, you know, as Christians, we cannot begin speculating about knowledge by itself. We cannot ask how we know without at the same time asking what we know. You can never get behind what you know to be true. Right? We have to start that there is knowledge out there and people have it. Now, some people say, well, Van Til is inconsistent on this point because you're not letting unbelievers start with assumptions like that there's knowledge in the world. So, so why do you get to? Seems kind of inconsistent that you would do this. <clears throat> and remember, this is a, 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 a misunderstanding of what, what we're doing here. Um, I'm fine with unbelievers using all sorts of assumptions. There are more than these that they, I would grant that they should, they should use. But they only make sense in a Christian interpretation of the world. They only have grounding in a Christian interpretation of the world. In an unbelieving world, you, you're, you are functioning in such a way that you have to make certain assumptions, and I don't deny that. Okay, that's clearly the case. But you have no evidence and no way to know that your assumptions marry up with reality. There's no connection. You have no way to know the nature of reality. We got into this a little, a little earlier. So there's no, I have no problem with you making assumptions, but you understand the assumptions that you're making lead to Christianity is true. These things that you have to assume lead to Christianity is true without exception. They lead there with certainty. All truth is God's truth. So take the truth and you're gonna to get to Christianity is true. So when you say assumptions, you can call it borrowed capital. Yeah. Correct. Assumptions, borrowed capital. Um, I can think of logic, right? Mm -hmm. That they're taking. What, what else are they taking? What other assumptions are borrowed capital? Uh, I'm going to drop. Uh, yeah, will you grab me a hymnal, please? Thanks. <clears throat> if I let go of this, will it fall? Okay. It worked. If I do it again, will it fall? Okay. Now, so what is that? That's, uh, Hume talks about this in the uniformity of nature, the problem of induction. Like, how do we know that, that the order that's in the world is still going to behave that way in the future? Okay, we assume it happened in the past, our memory, which gets into memory and how that's reliable and all these things. Um, we assume I could go through a number of things like that. What's that? Yeah, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. That's all the order of, of the universe. We also assume that, that people that we interact with have minds. How do I know that you have a mind? How would you prove such a thing, right? Philosophers talk about these things. How do you know that objects still exist unperceived? How do you know that when you turn the lights off, everything still exists that was in the room? It didn't just poof, you know, cease to exist until you turned on the lights and then confirmed it with your eyes again. Like these are things that people get into. These are all what we call transcendentals. I would say small t transcendentals. We have to assume them in our experience to make sense of anything else. And there are a, b a bunch of these things. The meaning of language is, is part of this, which we tapped into with, with Wittgenstein. OK, thank you. So we assume all those things constantly, but it's completely logically acceptable to conceive of a world that's irrational or, or is chaotic and, and disorderly. Right? That's not illogical. It's, it's easy to conceive of a world like that. Well, unbelievers have no good reason to think that the world actually is that way, or the world is orderly instead of disorderly. That's what Hume talks about. Now, they have to assume it's orderly, right? so they have to grant these assumptions, but they have no way to know it's actually that way. And that's the problem with unbelief. No matter what worldview you, ha worldview you have, you're in the dark. When you suppress the truth of God, you're blind. Very good. OK, <clears throat> so we have to accept this axiom. And 
What follows then is Christianity is true. If Christianity is the precondition for knowledge, the truth of it is, and there is knowledge, then Christianity is true. It's done. We've proven it. You don't like it? Fine. Disprove one of the axioms or show me how the definitions are somehow uh, not applicable or representative of how we communicate. What does it mean for Christianity to be true? I'm saying that the plain teachings of Christianity are in accordance with reality. The plain teachings. Now someone says, well, you can't restrict Christianity just to the plain teachings. Isn't in inerrancy doesn't that apply to all doctrines in, in the Bible? Yes, it does apply to all doctrines in the Bible. But we, we, we restrict the, our definition of Christianity to be what are the plain things, right? Because if you're not in, if you don't agree with all the plain things, then you're not a Christian, right? That's how we, that's how we draw the line between heresy and non-heresy. <clears throat> now notice though, the plain things grows over time. As we grow in knowledge, things that were, un, that were not plain to us are now plain, right? And that, now that's not changing the Bible, that's us growing in understanding. And that should happen for the next 10,000 years. Okay, I would expect that the, it's clarified more and more uh, what are the plain things and what are not. Like the historicity of Adam and Eve should be a confessional statement of every Christian church. It's not right now, but it should be. If we were united as Protestants, it should be. And if you deny that, you're a heretic. Boom. Like it's not hard. Like this is pretty plain. And there are other things, things like this. <clears throat> okay. So, so this, this is, um, I'll get some quotes here from Van Til and Bonson. Thus, there is absolutely certain proof for the existence of God and the truth of Christian theism. It's another thing that's kind of confusing with Bonson and Van Til is they, they uh, go back and forth with proving the existence of God and proving the truth of Christianity, proving the worldview of Christianity and the existence of God. But for them, it's the same thing. Like you can't, you can't pull one out of the other. <clears throat> so when they use those, those words, they mean these things together. I chose to prove the tr truth of Christianity, which obviously included in that is God's existence. Um, and that's really what they mean by that. Van Til says, Christian apologetics must accordingly in practice be a vindication of the Christian world and life view as a whole. It is this entire underlying worldview that is being defended, even when we answer a more narrow particular attack. Okay, <clears throat> so we're done. So we look back at this list, did we fulfill it? Did we start with the Bible? Yes. Everything we looked at to be true, <clears throat> we looked at through the lens of scripture. Did we use only basic principles that, that were consistent with the Bible? Yes, we did. <clears throat> is the argument sufficient for rational epistemic certainty? Yes, it is. It's valid. The assumptions, if they were to be false, would lead to absurdity in our world. And none of the definitions are objectionable. None of them are disputable. Are the axioms knowable prior to acknowledging the conclusion? Yes. I think if you took all these axioms and you individually went to atheists and asked them if they would accept these to be true, all, other than axiom four, I think they would for, for, for all of them. But axiom four, I would, we could just show them that they have no good reason for rejecting that as well. But they can do all that without realizing it leads to the truth of Christianity. And lastly, did we anywhere in this argument assume the truth of Christianity as an axiom? Was it hidden anywhere? I think you might get arguments that say it's hidden in Axiom 4. Wh where? You're assuming the Bible is truth to explain the reality. No, I'm not. I'm assuming that you can't demonstrate it to teach the falsehood. That doesn't mean it's the word of God. And I don't have to assume in the axiom it's the word of God for that to be true. I think that that's where people want to go. I understand it. But it's not. You have, I did not assume the truth of the conclusion in the axiom. Now, I never would have accepted the axiom if I didn't already know the Bible to be true, of course. This is where the circularity comes in. This is where true Vantillian circularity plays out. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to give you, write this stuff down. I'm going to give you, we just went through the ground level, like most in-depth way, for the most part, that you would go through this argument. Now we're going to start all the way at the top. We're going to start the most simplistic. So how, what would I teach my child? What would I have Allison memorize? What would I have her memorize in her catechism? It'd be something like this. Here's the, so this is the most simplistic I think it gets. Christianity is true because without God's love, we are lost. 
Christianity is true because without God's love, we are lost. Do we need to write these down? Send I'll send you the, the PDFs. So that's the most simplistic one. Now, let's say someone wants a little more information. Okay, well then I would change it to this. The world is meaningless if Christianity is false, but the world is not meaningless, so Christianity must be true. You could reword that and say, if Christianity is false, then the world is meaningless. The world is not meaningless, therefore, by modus tollens, Christianity must be true. That's a little more complicated, but yet I think a fifth grader can understand that. Okay, so now we're, we're going to keep, keep going here. Next one. This is more for the inquisitive you know, junior high student. Knowledge has a home in the Christian interpretation of the world. Knowledge has a home there. We cannot show knowledge to have a home in any other interpretation of the world. Therefore, Christianity is the only home for knowledge. And since man possesses knowledge, Christianity must be true. Now notice, as we're getting more complicated, this is all dependent on the person to whom I'm speaking. If they want more, if he wants more, then I'll give him more. If he's, if he's, if he's satisfied with at any one of these levels, I wouldn't say, no, but you don't understand. It should be more complicated than that. You should, you should bring up this objection. Like, I wouldn't do that, right? If, if he's good at this level, then just move on to the gospel. But the person wants more, okay? We'll give him more, right? We'll go more complicated. So this is how, this is how I would present it to an audience, a general audience of people. And this can be done in under two minutes. We have four axioms. The Bible plainly teaches, the first four, the Bible plainly teaches that all people know with certainty that God created the world. Second axiom is that all these people who know with certainty that God created the world know with certainty that the world is orderly. The Bible plainly teaches that. Third axiom is that this Bible is inerrant, without error from God. It teaches that plainly. And the fourth one is you can't demonstrate it teaches a falsehood. Now, if all four of those things are true, then we can infer theorem one, which is that Christianity is, is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. Knowledge has a home in the Christian worldview. All right, now our next axiom is that the Bible teaches that no anti-Christian worldview is a sufficient foundation for knowledge. Now from there, we can infer that if you could demonstrate that there were one, then you, demonst you could demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. That's our theorem number two. But we just saw in axiom number four that you can't do that. You can't demonstrate that the Bible teaches a falsehood. So through modus tollens, axiom four and theorem two, we get theorem three, which is that no one can demonstrate that an anti-Christian worldview teaches a falsehood. And then our next axiom is that, well, look, if, if Christianity is sufficient for knowledge and you can't demonstrate that any other one is, anti-Christian one is, then we can infer theorem four, which is Christianity is the only sufficient foundation for knowledge. And if we're there, then the last axiom is that there is knowledge. People have knowledge. So therefore, with theorem four, we can infer theorem five, which is that Christianity is true. So I just summed up what we just did for the last five sessions, right? Four or five sessions in under two minutes. I'd probably go a little slower if no one had this background. But my point is though, it's not hard now because we've gone to the, the bedrock of this. It's not hard to start then simplistically and then work our way down to more uh, advanced. So if someone wanted more from this, then we just continue to give, give them more. Then that doesn't go on forever. Right? We've, we've, we've unearthed all of these objections already that, that, could, that could come up. Okay, so I was gonna go, I'll, I'll save the rest of this uh, for, for next time. Uh, next time will be our last session. We, wonderful questions today. This is really good. This is the most interactive that we've had it. And it was all because of Axiom 4. I just, it's great. It's, we need to use Axiom 4 more. We should make a t-shirt t-shirt of this. <laughs> okay, so wonderful questions, great interaction. The next time, which will be two weeks from today, will be our last session. And what I'm going to do is, I love, I love Van Til, I love Bonson, I love their legacy. I, I, dare, I care 
more than anyone you probably will ever meet about their legacy and continuing on this work. Uh, however, that doesn't mean I don't disagree with them. I think it's really important for to truly do their work to clean up some stuff that they did. That doesn't mean that they foundationally had things wrong, but they were unclear at certain points and, and were frankly just wrong at, at other points, I think. And so we're gonna do some, some cleanup work in honor of their, of their legacy. Because to truly do this work well for the next 10,000 years, we need to continue to clean, clean up stuff. And it would be, what a blessing in 50 to 100 years if someone were to look back on this and clean up some stuff that I did. Be great, that's how we advance in the church. So that's what we're gonna do our last session. We're gonna do some, some cleanup work. So come out for that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for our church. I thank you for the active minds that we have. Uh, it's such a blessing to me personally uh, to talk about apologetics and to have people hungry for it and to think through our faith. Uh, help us, Lord, never to lose sight of that. In using our minds, we are trying to understand you and your world better. That's what we are trying to do, understand you and your world better. Please lift us up in worship today. Amen.